So, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, for inviting me to, to be here. It's a long trip and uh, the AC in my uh, flights did this to my voice, but I hope that you can still understand me and hear me well. Um, so today I'm not going to say a lot of uh, sort of very novel things, but I want to say some things about something that I became particularly interested in when thinking about, about this conference. And I hope that I can do later on some, some more work on, on this topic. Um, so I'm basically thinking about the way that uh, cognitive psychology uh, in medieval philosophy actually applied to ethical or action theory. Uh, and I start thinking about this because uh, it seems that there's a kind of uh, tension between two assumptions that we normally hold. The assumption between the idea that the freedom of voluntary decision is the source of all political power, and at the same time, the idea that perception has the power to determine our picture of the world. So there seems to be a conflict between the idea that we are completely free agents, right, when we exercise our will. At the same time, it seems, traditionally at least, that the power of perception is a passive power, in the sense that the world and the way that the objects are constituted, then uh, the features, sensible properties that they have, they impinge upon us, and then we come to have the picture of the world as the result of this causal action of the objects. So there seems to be some sort of disconnect. And I think this disconnect is particularly the case once we think about a debate in the 13th century and then it continues between the so-called intellectualists and voluntarists. Um, so a uh, major representative of uh, the intellectual intellectualists is, of course, Thomas Aquinas. And of course, there are now a lot of people saying that, well, he wasn't really intellectualist. And maybe you can also understand Aquinas as being a voluntarist. But the idea is that Aquinas seems to be committed to a, a couple of very important ideas. So only what the will knows can actually uh, will. So the will is dependent on the intellect to identify what is the good. And once the good is identified, then we can will that. <clears throat> so what it is proper for a thing, what the thing is explains what the thing does. That's the principle of our Sicilian thought. So that um, the, whatever activities a thing is capable of is defined by what kind of thing it is. We are rational beings, and that means that we aim at knowing the true and to will or do the good. Um, so in that case, is the will free or not? Well, it seems that the will cannot be free with respect at least to the good. Whenever the intellect presents the good to the will, then the will necessarily have to follow. There is a certain freedom of the will in the sense that for all the other cases that are not the good, then of course the will can decide the minor goods. Uh, the will can of course decide. And there is of course a long debate, but the interesting point to hold is that it seems that this intellectualist tradition, at least whether or not Aquinas is to be counted among them, the causality um, from the world to the subject seems to be the real explanatory, explanatory uh, principle. So the object causes us to have a certain perception, uh, and then that perception causes a certain act of the intellect, and then that act of the intellect causes an act of the will. So is the will free? Well, at least in so far as it is concerned the good, the will is not free. So let's present another example. That's all I have time to today. Another ex uh, an example of the opposite figure, uh, Peter John Olivier. And of course, I cannot go into the details of the whole cognitive theory of Olivier, of also all the theory of the will of Olivier. But I, I just want to give you a certain contrast so that you can understand whether or not the kind of tension that I said it existed is actually true, right? So of course. 
Peter John Olivier is not the first author to, fu to fight for the freedom of the will. He, he at least follows Henry of Ghent, Henry of Ghent and Augustinian from the 13th century. Uh, but in some aspects, at least in the question of the will, uh, Olivier is really uh, more Augustinian or more Franciscan than, than, than Henry of Ghent. And today I'm just going to focus on one particular question of his commentary to the sentences. Uh, for all, for the others that don't know, uh, medieval theologians, there are the common textbook that is the, the book of sentences of Peter Lombard that they were supposed to comment. So there was, we have a tradition of commentaries to Peter of Lombard so that we can understand the development of, of their views about the intellect, will, uh, faith, uh, sacraments, etc. Today I'm just going to focus on one particular question that is a very long question. It takes around 110 edited pages in the critical edition. So that means that in the manuscript is a really massive, massive question. Um, and the question that Olivier asks there is whether the free choice of the will, libero arbitrio, or the free will, voluntas libera, is an active or passive power. So he presents the argument for the opposite, opposite view. In a very scholastic tradition, you start by presenting the argument of the view that you do not hold, and then you criticize, and then you present the view that you hold. So in this case, he's basically repeating some of the arguments that you find in this intellectual tradition. Uh, Aquinas may be the per person you have in mind, but it's not clear that that is the case. The will is passive because all, passive, all powers of the soul are passive. The will cannot be self-moved because nothing, no power is capable of causing uh, uh, its own motion. Something external to the moved thing has to be the principle of that motion. All this is traditional Aristotelian ideas. But also that the diversities of, uh, of, uh, diversity of acts of a power cannot originate in this power. Otherwise, the power would have to be infinite, right? So the acts of the power, its diversity has to be caused by the objects of those acts that have to be external to the power. So the theory goes. And so the power of perception and also the power of will cannot be active. Otherwise, we can will or perceive objects that do not exist. So again, there has to be an external cause for this uh, activity of the power. Um, and again, I, I think I will skip this example, but it's a bit a continuation of this ca causal explanation, right? So whenever a, a power, the traditional view has it, that whenever a power goes from a state of potentiality to a state of actuality, there has to be this external agent causing it to go from this state of, say, potentially seeing to the state of actually seeing. In the case of sight, it has to be a colored, uh, a colored object. When there is a colored object, then my capacity for sight uh, goes from a state of potentiality to a state of actuality. Now, one theory has it that uh, there has to be a contact between the power and the objects of that power. But if, that, if the power would be active rather than passive, then the power would have to extend where the object is. So imagine the stars, that's the example. So imagine if I am seeing a star, if the power is active, then the power somehow has to be there touch the stars and then bring back that information. They replaced this idea and they created some sort of representations called species. And these species are nothing but certain likeness or representation of a sensible feature of the object that is transmitted, that is generated and transmitted from the object to the perceiver, allowing the power to be actualized. So there is a colorful, colored object the, co the species of color from that object is issued from the object, travels through the eye, so there needs to be certain environmental conditions, comes in contact with the power and activates the power. I can see that colored object. But again, still, we are operating on a causal uh, framework where um, you know, that object, the thing that I perceive or the thing that I will, is actually the cause of my perceiving and willing it. But uh, Olivier thinks that this cannot be the case, and cannot be the case because 
the, the wheel needs to be absolutely free, and it needs to be absolutely free from theological reasons concerning salvation and also moral responsibility. So if it is something external, or even if it is the intellect causing the act of the will, then the will is not free, and therefore my actions that I have decided cannot be meritorious, right? So he's look, he looks at the intellectualists and say like, well, your account is dependent on this causal account of perception and also the power of the intellect to cause the acts of the will. But if that's the case, then our acts of the will are not free, but they are necessitated by the causal sequence that gave rise to those acts of the will. And therefore, we shouldn't go that way. And then he says that, well, um, it's true that the, that an act of the will or a cognitive act needs to have an object, but it need not be caused by that object. And he introduces the distinction between the object is the end point, uh, the terminus the, uh, of, the, of the act, cognitive or, uh, or uh, volitional, and the will is the principle, the effective cause of uh, that act. I think I can explain this with, uh, with an analogy um, that I, I came across when I was, or I thought when I was flying. So let's imagine a radar, right? Uh, so we have a radar. There is an instrument, electronic instrument, that sends some sort of uh, uh, wave or uh, a signal. And that signal has to uh, touch a certain object. And once it encounters a certain obstacle to its progression, it comes back and brings that information. Right? And then the radar is able to, uh, to identify that there is an object. Now, there has to be an object there in order for the radar to signal and identify that there is an object. But that object is not the cause of the act of the radar, because the act of the radar was already before actually touching that object. But the content of the act of the, of the act of the power is defined or determined by that object. So that's exactly what Olivier wants to say. It is true that all acts of the soul, like acts of the will, they actually need to have an object, but they are not, and in, insofar as they have that contact, as they are aimed at that object, uh, they are determined by that object, but they are not caused by, their obje by that object. Uh, so it's not the object that causes the radar, but the object is just there preventing the object, the, the, the ray, or the, not the ray, the uh, wave. The wave, the wave to, exactly, to, to, to stop its natural progression. And that means that the radar has an unlimited scope, right? It can go in every single direction, and then it's stopped. It is determined by the particular object that it encounters and brings information about that particular object. So important difference for Olivier is to be the efficient cause uh, of, the, of the action, and the second thing to be the contents of that act. So. Um, but, um, so there are, of course, certain restrictions of the action of the will. It has, must target an object, of course, and that the object has to be of a certain kind. What kind is that? Is the kind that has to be appropriate to the power, right? Uh, 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 Olivier presents this with a very interesting, oh, I, I have time, yeah, five minutes. So it presents this with a very interesting example. So everybody knows there's still an example of a seal and the wax, right? And Aristotle uses this to explain perception. So you have a seal and you have a piece of wax. And with the seal imprints the form in the wax. And then you say that, um, the, like in the sense is that the object impresses its form into uh, the senses without the matter, right? Because it's the matter of the wax. But Olivier transforms this into another example. He says that, no, no, it's actually not the seal that is causing the imprinting in the wax, but it's rather that the wax, it is, as it were, a living thing that it's able to adjust and mold itself 
to the seal, taking on the form of the seal. But the activity, the efficient cause of this coming to have the form that it has, is of the wax, the living wax, rather than the seal that is causing this impression. So again, the content of the act is determined by the object, but the efficient cause of the act is the power itself. And as the result of this, he says that the will must be absolutely free because it's just a living wax. It can assimilate itself to whatever object, but it's not the object that is causing uh, the acts of, of the will. Now, uh, one interesting thing that one can say about this is to say, well, maybe then it's nothing external that causes the acts of the will, but maybe there are certain determinants that are internal to the power, like certain habits or dispositions. So if I am a being that has a certain, uh, that I am habituated or disposed to take something as being good or to be the source of my action, um, then there is some, something internal to the power that is actually, that is yet something in addition to the power that is sort of determining the causal action of the power. But Olivier completely uh, refuses that. And he actually gives an interesting example. If it is a disposition of fire, it is true that fire acts by means of heat, but we cannot say that heat is the cause of the action of fire. Rather, is fire the cause of the, uh, the disposition of heat? It's the efficient cause. So it is true that it can be some sort of uh, uh, determinations or modifications of the act, but again, it's not the cause of the act, because the cause of the act is fire and the cause of the act of our uh, operations is, is the will. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of uh, to say about this, but uh, uh, and the interesting point that I just wanted to say there is that Holivy is really willing to push the envelope a bit further and actually to say that um, that even in certain states like the state of ecstasy and where we are affected in, in, in terms of the that our will is affected, he's still willing to say, but it is true that certain states can alter our um, the way that we act, but still we are fully responsible for those actions to be called free actions or acts of the will, then we still have to be completely uh, responsible for those. And he tries to explain this by saying that the only acts that actually count as acts of the will are acts, and cognitive acts for that matter, are those that we are aware as being ours. And he is actually the first author to say that one condition for uh, mental acts is that those acts are phenomenologically relevant, that we perceive, that we identify, that we are aware of them as being our acts. There, I could spend quite a bit of time talking about this, but I have five minutes, probably, I six minutes. But, uh, conclusions. I'm terrible at keeping time, so I'm going to be late. Uh, not, not very late, but a bit late, at least. And I think that Olivier's uh, model challenges a bit our co common assumption, the point that I made earlier on, right? That there seems to be a certain tension uh, between you know, the freedom of our voluntary decisions, the freedom of the will as being the source of all the political power at the same time that we can accept that and at the same time accept that all our perceptions are passive and we are fully determined by the world and its constituting objects. And I think that people normally took those as, well, it, there is no tension there, it's, it's just fine. And I think that what Levy wants to say is that, well, and if we sort of thought about all this in a different way, if we take a view that is like perception is full and cognition is fully passive, is fully active, then we can actually come to the thought that the will can then be fully free because it's also uh, fully active. So instead of thinking that perception is a passive process and then the will somehow there miraculously comes to be, can be free, then it says like, no, no, let's take the other way. That's all mental acts are fully active and therefore the will has one of those uh, uh, powers and that it is also uh, completely active and therefore completely free. So maybe we should investigate 
whether or not there is in the historical sources that we look at a tension or not between the passive nature of perception and then the freedom of the will, or if there is nothing like that, and so you can just have these, these two parallel lines running through the medieval period. Thank you very much. <laughs>